All right, so we are looking at our 10th day here. Uh, this will be our final PowerPoint for this course. Um, and we're looking at exercise. <laughs> we're looking at the exercise and health benefits. So like uh, why exercise is good for you and like why being healthy is good for you, you know, making good choices. Um, so this guy, this is kind of a funny, um, this is a funny PowerPoint in my opinion because uh, <laughs> it does kind of feel kind of disjointed. It kind of feels like it's like all of the, you know, um, intro stuff that is like, here's what we got to justify, like learning this field of science. And it just kind of like throws it all together in like one big PowerPoint. So we're going to see a lot of good information, but it's going to be kind of all over the map. And a lot of it's going to kind of feel like uh, our special populations class in a way where there's some injuries that are going to be mentioned and then a bunch of other stuff as well. So um, we're also going to see a wall of learning objectives today, which is funny because again, there's, there's, I've been, in my opinion, a little less in this one. Um, so we do need to be able to understand like some diseases and disabilities that come along with being inactive. Obviously coronary heart disease is going to be the biggest one. Uh, why a sedentary lifestyle is so dangerous and what the benefits of like exercise is medicine, uh, sort of like applies, right? Like we know that all of these things come from a sedentary lifestyle, then obviously there is a need for having an active lifestyle. So uh, we're gonna be able to kind of describe like why there is uh, and a relationship between like being active and like being healthy, right? So um, we'll also talk a little bit about like, what does it mean when we say like, let's become active, you know, like what type of exercise should you do? Like what's your intensity, what's your frequency, things like that. Uh, we will talk a little bit about the carbon and method as well, which again, kind of seems like it's out of nowhere because. It was mentioned on our cardio day, uh, but the carbon method is a method for which, you know, we prescribe exercise intensity. Uh, and then we will also talk about like how to develop an actual like exercise program uh, in regards to using like um, your RPE scale, uh, your percentage of max heart rate and things like that. Oh my God, there is one more. Of course, there, no, there's two more. Look at that. There's so many learning objectives. So weird. Uh, <laughs> and we'll talk about like the health benefits of like resistance training as well. Um, differences between strength, power, and endurance, uh, and then how to, you know, describe, um, how exercise needs to be modified with certain specific diseases. Right. Um, okay. So first one we're looking at, uh, the big thing we need to remember that is <laughs> we are on slide eight of 36 and we just did the intro. Um, Sorry, I'm not being critical. I am being critical, but I'm not trying to be harsh. Uh, so <laughs> we're looking at like obviously being in a very overweight society, right? Like, um, so like, where is that coming from? If we're like defining like what we mean uh, by being like overweight, right? They're putting a definition here, which is defined as having more body weight than is optimally healthy. Um, that is, that's I actually I actually like that definition a lot better than the definition that's in your regular textbook. So in your regular textbook, if you look at the definition of overweight, it will say uh, typically characterized by having a BMI between 25.0 and 29.9. So if we know that like your BMI, right? So if we define like overweight here, um, right, that is going to be defined as having more body fat than is optimally healthy. Um, and there's a reason I like that term a lot better. I like that term a lot better because like you are taking into account like somebody's specifics and then you are determining like whether or not that is optimal for them, right? Like if they are uh, in a body way that is like causing them to have heart disease or it's causing them to like move inefficiently and causing problems in their life, then yeah, that is defined as overweight, which I like a lot better than just like saying, hey, your BMI is 25 or higher, you know? Um, that I've known plenty of people who are outside of normal BMI ranges who are incredibly healthy, you know? Um, so I, I, I definitely like this definition better, but we should be aware uh, of the fact that like, like it says here in the PowerPoint, uh, typically characterized by having a BMI between 25.0 and uh, 29.9. Uh, and then we'll see like, um, so when we're talking about like what a BMI is, right? Your BMI or your body mass index, right? Uh, is going to be defined as uh, the amount uh, uh, the, uh, 
weight of an individual in kilograms uh, divided by their height in meters squared. Um, I need to make that all fonty. Um, so it's your, it's, so if we look at that, right? So BMI equals uh, weight in kilograms. Uh, uh, alt zero two four seven. Gosh, nailed it. Uh, divided by height in again meters squared. Okay, so that's what that's gonna look like, right? So then we've got a couple different BMIs here that we wanna be aware of, right? Uh, if 25 to 29.9 is considered overweight, uh, let's go ahead and put like our normal BMI scales up here, right? So um, if we do this, BMI chart, when you're looking at it, a lot of times you're gonna see it look like this. Um, this isn't necessarily a bad table. You can see it actually shows uh, it's kind of adjusted. Okay, well, that's not all. Uh, it's actually kind of adjusted for somebody's like height uh, versus their weight here. And so you see the chart move this way. Um, that's not bad. Uh, generally, one of the easiest ways to do it is honestly just to look at um, uh, a list of like what is considered like your BMI categories, right? So if you are below 18.5, that is going to be considered underweight. That's one of the ways that we define uh, like a lot of eating disorders actually. So if we have like underweight, right, that's going to be a BMI of less than, uh, less than 18.5. Um, so if you were to take somebody's weight in kilograms and you were to divide it by their height in meters squared, uh, that would give you, and their BMI came out to 18.4, that would mean that they are falling into the underweight category. Uh, then we got the normal weight category, which I hate that term, uh, but the normal weight category is going to be 18.5 up to uh, 24.9, uh, okay? So 24.9 uh, is as high as we want our BMI to go to be considered in the normal weight category. Uh, then we're going to see overweight, right, uh, which we already talked about. That's going to be 25 to 29.9. Um, and then lastly, we have the obese category, uh, and the obese category is going to be anything that is greater than 30, okay? So anytime your BMI is, is, a, is 30 or above, that is going to be leading to uh, the obese category. So, you know, all of these are, you know, just calculations of like height versus weight, right? Like that's not exactly a perfect way to categorize somebody's health, which is one of the reasons why I like, I don't particularly like the definition of like, you know, overweight being this, but like in regards to the BMI, yes, these are average ranges. And with an average body, these do actually tell you a little bit about like somebody's health, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to have all these diseases, but the key to understanding like whoa, why we're talking about BMI is because like we do find statistically, like this is just a numbers game, um, we do find that statistically if you fall into either of these categories, uh, you are more at risk for getting certain health related diseases. Like you are X number of times more likely to develop heart disease uh, if your BMI is 30, 31, 32, 33, like whatever it happens to be, right? And that actually eventually leads to our other categories, which we'll be talking about later in this module uh, when we talk about like extreme obesity. So we'll talk about like class one and class two obesity. Um, so it gets a little bit uh, more intense the further you go out. Um, but again, there's no reason you couldn't be healthy with an, with a, an abnormal BMI range. You just have to you know, do all of the, do a lot of the things that we talk about when it comes to being active, right? Um, so, how the heck does all of this happen? Like, how do we, how do we, and like, uh, you know, obviously being overweight is is incredibly common in the U.S. Where does it come from? Well, a lot of it stems from an increase in technology, right? 
Um, so we do know that like overweight um, status is often associated with a lack of physical activity, right? So due to increasingly sedentary lifestyles um, and improvements in technology, right? Uh, people are simply not burning as much energy throughout the day as is considered healthy, right? So we're just not seeing it as often. We're just not seeing people, you know, uh, move as much as they really should. And so, uh, and we know that like activity has a ton of benefits, right? The benefits of increasing your activity are going to reduce your risk of certain diseases that will shorten your life. Um, they'll reduce your risk for diseases that cost you money. Like if you're, if you're not necessarily the type of person who's like, like, I'm just not very health conscious. It's not very important to me, but you are like a frugal person. Um, Hey, that's cool. I can use that. You know, like I can think of a million different reasons that are not always just like you running around the bases at a baseball park, uh, why you should be more active. You know, um, it affects every single solitary aspect of your life. Um, and this kind of goes back to what we talk about in a lot of our program design classes. The reason people seek out personal trainers is they are seeking to improve their overall quality of life. A lot of times for us, we send, tend to have perspective on, it's like, well, you're healthier, you're going to be happier. And the reality of the situation is not everybody is like that sometimes, you know, like some people are just not very health conscious, you know, um, I, I'm going to use them as an example. I talk about them a lot, but like, I do kind of feel like my parents are actually like this. Like my parents, um, like my mom quit smoking because it bothered me. She did not do it because she would be around longer <laughs> or that it like she felt better and like she does feel better like don't get me wrong um she's admitted to it but like that's not why she quit smoking <laughs> um she did it as like a it was like a it was her graduation gift to me <laughs> was to quit smoking and she's been successful you know like she stopped and i was like you know and i always tell my mom like all the time i try to like continually reinforce because I, I think that it's important for me to you know this is part of the deal uh, is I'm always telling her it's like, you know, best graduation gift ever, because like that's, you know, rather than getting a car, you know, whatever people get for graduation gifts, uh, <laughs> you know, I got a few year, few more years with my mom, you know? Um, so I love to like bring that up with her all the freaking time. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's, we, you, sometimes you need to cut down to the motivations that are actually important to somebody. So we're going to be looking at like the health benefits today, but I definitely want everybody to kind of think of like, you know, when you're trying to explain like the health benefits to people, sometimes that's not always the greatest path to actually getting somebody to adhere to an exercise program. You need to learn a little bit about their personality and find what's important to them. Some people want to look a certain way, you know, some people want to perform a certain way. Think about how many athletes, you know, sacrifice their bodies. <laughs> they sacrifice their health to be better at their sport. You know, I do it. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, whenever I, like I, I've been in like ultimate tournaments and I've gotten hurt and you're injured or something, I still go out there and play because like, you know, in a weird way, that's more important to me at the time. Um, so if somebody was trying to like sell me on the concept of fitness, you know, they're going to be like, well, it'll make you better at ultimate Frisbee. And I'm like, sold, done. I'm in, let's do this. <laughs> um, so, uh, the benefits of exercise are obviously going, so we're going to kind of back to into the health side of things, but like the benefiting of exercise is going to be a decreasing your risk of those chronic diseases that can shorten your life expectancy. Um, and we will experience like a benefit for, for youths as well, right? Like it's not just like that you benefit from all these things when you get older, you're not healthy by default, you know, um, it takes like effort and time. Um, so regular life and uh, regular exercise and life expectancy have been shown to like um, increase your longevity. That's that's not how I want to say that. Uh, but regular exercise has been shown to increase your longevity. There is a direct, direct correlation between long life and being physically active. Um, so uh, life expectancy. is directly affected by um, 
physical activity levels. Okay, uh, that is definitely something to to be aware of, right? We just like I was talking about. I was talking about my my great grandfather. He had like a really strong grip, and we see like correlations between grip strength and long life. I don't think there's anything magical about grip strength. I mean, theoretically, it lowers your blood pressure overall, which you know, good blood pressure is obviously a really important like part of being healthy, um, and it keeps blood from like pooling in your extremities by having like you know, trained your grip and stuff. Um, that's why they give people with hypertension like those stress balls. Um, <laughs> but like, uh, I think that that's actually just a sign of somebody who's physically active, you know? Um, we see people with like physically active jobs live longer, you know, as long as it's not something that's also dealing with like chemicals and things like that. Um, and so like, there's a direct correlation here, right? Um, so longevity, or how long somebody is going to live will be affected by uh, you are going to see low physical activity is going to be one, right? Um, we're going to see poor nutritional habits. That's going to be another one, like people who are, you know, um, continually going out to get fast food or not getting enough like vitamins and minerals in their diet. And then smoking is huge. I mean, to this day, it's, it's funny. It, I can't believe we're still having the conversation on smoking, but sure enough, like, you know, I remember, I remember like being in the middle of school, uh, like in college and just being like, man, like we're going to see the end of smoking in our lifetime. Like surely now that the internet is more popular, you know, like now that like we as a society have access to more information, surely we're going to see less and less and less smoking. And then vaping came along and I was like, no freaking way. <laughs> and like, you know, finally vaping has been around long enough that we're starting to see um, long-term scientific studies that are proving, yeah, shocker, it's just as bad, you know? Which by the way, anybody who knows anything about biology knew instantly. Putting solutes, AKA little bits of stuff in a wet, sticky environment means that that stuff can't leave. And if it can't leave, it's there forever because you are a closed sack. <laughs> Nothing disappears. <laughs> like when you smoke a cigarette, that cigarette now lives in your lungs, except for the parts that you did see exhale. But think about how much of it didn't get exhaled, <laughs> right? Um, we knew this centuries ago, by the way. Uh, well, is that an exaggeration? Hold on one second. I'm going to look this up. Um, law of conservation of energy, a cigarette. Okay, so there's a there's a rule in there's a rule in the world of like physics, and it's called the first it's the first law of thermodynamics. And I'm bringing this up, you know, not to get completely, completely, completely sidetracked here and off topic, um, but this will actually be very important for us in this module. So the law of conservation of energy uh, is the first most important rule of physics, and basically what it says is that nothing uh, can come uh, some uh, you can never get something from nothing. Uh, that's basically a simple way to think about it, right? Um, if something has existed, it will always continue to exist forever. <laughs> like nothing can be created, nothing can be destroyed. Everything that exists has existed. Um, it has just changed from one form to another. So even if you think of like a hamburger that you ate, uh, well, that hamburger became like heat energy and ATP and then got exhaled as CO2. Like you converted that to like a bunch of push-ups, and you converted it to, you know, exhaling CO2. So one of the ways they actually figured this out, and I wanna see if this is here. Um, oh no. So one of the ways that they first discovered this, and this was discovered forever ago. When was this stated? Well, okay, probably not 550 BC. That's, that's pretty dang early. Uh, <laughs> but probably some like, Pre versions of this. But one of the ways they figured this out was literally they took a cigarette and they weighed it and then they put, they lit it on fire and they put a lid on the cigarette and burnt it up until the cigarette disappeared, right? There's no cigarette left. Um, but every, that scale still weighed the same amount. Yeah, all that got converted into smoke, which we think of as like, oh, the cigarette's gone. There's a little bit of ash there, which is clearly much smaller than an actual cigarette. So some of the cigarette disappeared. 
No, it did not. <laughs> it just changed forms. It's still there. Um, and that's one of the things we need to understand. Like, that's the law of conservation of energy, right? Energy cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed. If it exists, it will continue to exist. It can change forms. You can take a hamburger and turn it into, you know, fat cells or glycogen or burn it up as energy or break down the proteins to make new muscle. You know, there's a lot of things you can do to it, but no matter what, like it still exists in a different form somewhere else. Um, so we have to kind of remember that. That's going to be really important in our weight loss class coming up uh, <laughs> and is going to be really important in nutrition starting next week. Um, we are going to be talking a lot about conservation of energy. So anyway, um, I just remember talking about like cigarettes and being like, surely what is important to people is going to be long life. And so like, we're going to see that disappear and we have it, you know, um, because people value other things. They value either that immediate comfort or they value, uh, they value like the social aspect of it. There's other things. So we need to find a way to explain to people that we can still create all of that value through like a healthy lifestyle. And that's really kind of what we're saying in this, this whole slide today. So longevity is affected by a lot of these things. These are some of the biggest ones. Um, inactivity, right? So by being an inact, having an inactive lifestyle uh, can lead to, we're gonna see things like sarcopenia. Um, sarcopenia is a decrease in the number of muscle fibers. So your body will can literally eliminate how many muscle cells it has. Um, that is a, it's the same as like osteoporosis, right? Osteoporosis, which surely, well, it's actually not on here. Um, <laughs> osteoporosis, right? I'm actually gonna put that up here. Um, right, is going to be a, uh, a decrease in bone density. You can think of sarcopenia as a decrease in muscle density, you know? It can lead to depression uh, because your body uh, can literally make all of those, you know, stress hormones, but then it doesn't really have the ability to make anti-stress hormones. So then those hormones start to affect how you feel and think. Uh, obviously, we're going to see coronary heart disease. Um, remember, like, part of exercise, one of the reasons why... Uh, one of the reasons why exercise like has such a positive effect on things like coronary heart disease. Well, first let's define coronary heart disease, right? Like that's plaque on the inside uh, blood vessels of the heart, right? Like if we look at like um, coronary plaque, right? Um, you can see this is literally fatty tissue building up on the inside of your walls here. So where does that fatty tissue come from? Well, typically it's in the form of low density cholesterol, right? So, what does like why the heck do we even have cholesterol in our diet like why is our body our body so bad at moving cholesterol around well you got to remember that low density stuff is i always like to think of it as like you know it's your ldl cholesterol it's your lazy density cholesterol stands for low density but like it is it's very lazy and so it ends up just parking itself on your blood vessel and now you have this really nice smooth tube that you know red blood cells which are solid little part you know solid little things, uh, now they can't move as effectively, right? They're literally going to like run into some friction here. Um, and your immune system is actually going to come along and like build tissue up over that plaque. So now you're just seeing like less space that increases your blood pressure, which means that your heart has to work harder, which is dangerous. Um, and you know, there's not a ton of pressure in your heart here you know, it comes right out of the aorta, but like branch is really small. So this is, I mean, plaque anywhere in your body is dangerous, but particularly when you have it blocking uh, the tubes that supply the pump with oxygen and nutrients, that's a very dangerous thing because if the pump dies, you're not going to be able to deliver oxygen anywhere. Um, so, you know, that low density cholesterol builds up here. So we have cholesterol in our diet. So why the heck uh, does exercise have such a positive effect on it? Well, you got to remember that cholesterol is a precursor to hormones. So if you have cholesterol in your diet and you are like exercising regularly, not only does that make your heart pump harder and then strengthen your heart, which means it's more likely to push blood cells through and knock that crap off the walls. But at the same time, like you're going to be converting those cholesterol proteins into 
hormones. And so that will also have a, an, an overall positive effect on your cholesterol. So exercise is good in a million different ways for that. Looking at another one, we've got diabetes here, right? Diabetes is another uh, very common disease, heavily, heavily associated with obesity, right? Um, obesity is really interesting because like typically one of the other ways that we look at like uh, measuring someone's health is we look at how much abdominal fat they have. We do know that like high body fat percentages are dangerous, but we also know that particularly heavy amounts of abdominal fat are even more dangerous. Like you can have a higher body fat percentage if it's evenly distributed uh, and be better off than somebody who has a, the same body fat percentage but has more abdominal fat. And we think the reason for that is uh, fat starts to kind of act like its own organ when there's a lot of it in one section. And so like that can lower uh, your affinity for certain hormones. Particularly in the case of diabetes, uh, it's going to lower your affinity uh, for a hormone called insulin, right? So insulin's job is to take glucose out of your blood and send it to your cells. Um, now, if you don't do that, then that sugar just kind of keeps running through your blood. Glucose just kind of keeps circulating there. And it actually makes it very, very hard for oxygen to be able to get into your cells because there's just all this other stuff in the way. And so it literally causes like suffocation of your cells. Remember cellular respiration is all about your cells bringing in O2 molecules. So if diabetes is preventing that from happening because you have so much sugar in your blood, it can cause like tissue death. And that's why we see uh, people with diabetics, like, you know, typically they have trouble in like their extremities. You'll hear about like, um, uh, problems in like the toes and the fingers and things like that, or you'll hear about neuropathy, you'll hear about like, um, uh, you know, nerve damage. Uh, and that's because those nerve cells eat a lot of oxygen. But, you know, uh, also, there's also low blood flow areas in the extremities. So that's one of the things we see with diabetes. Uh, we're gonna see asthma, right? That's going to be a big one that's associated with inactivity, not training your respiratory system. So then your respiratory system becomes weak and it becomes very difficult for you to bring in massive amounts of O2 molecules. Now there's just not very many in your chest. And so they don't diffuse into your blood as effectively. That decreases everything in your body because again, everything relies on oxygen. And then we're also going to see hypertension, right? High blood pressure. Um, that's a very, very common thing that we see with being inactive, right? Again, often linked to, uh, you know, that plaque and that high cholesterol that we talked about earlier, but also just like when you are not using your blood vessels, you know, you got to remember your blood vessels are controlled by like little muscular contractions as well. They're able to dilate and they're able to constrict and dilate and constrict. And so like when you're taking specific medications, um, uh, that can affect your blood pressure. And a lot of times those medications are, you know, related to an unhealthy lifestyle or just being inactive, you know, your blood vessels don't get used to being worked. So, um, all of these are kind of like big things that we need to be aware of. And we've talked about a lot of these diseases in our special populations class. And a lot of these are going to come back again in this module, uh, particularly ones that are associated with um, sedentary lifestyle. So when you've got a new client who is becoming active, like let's say, we're like let's, let's kind of chart the journey here of somebody who comes to the gym or, or somebody who just decides to hire a personal trainer, they're thinking about becoming healthy, right? Well, the first thing you're gonna always need to do, right, uh, is start with like a, a medical evaluation. And I say medical evaluation only because it's in this slide. Um, it's really like our version of an assessment is not a medical evaluation. <laughs> so like instead, we would consider that just like a fitness evaluation, right? We're gonna measure whether or not somebody has trouble moving a certain way or whether or not somebody has trouble uh, like performing certain bouts of cardio. So one of the things we're gonna do to, I was about to say on Friday, tomorrow, uh, <laughs> is we're gonna do a little bit of like a three minute step test and a rock or walk test, right? Um, both of those are cardiovascular assessments. And so that's gonna tell us a little bit about like how well your cardiovascular system performs under a very specific amount of stress. And so obviously uh, getting information on that is gonna tell us about the efficiency of that cardiovascular system. So first start with your PARQ, then move through uh, like your general and medical history questionnaire, and then move through like an evaluation of like posture, 
cardiorespiratory uh, fitness and things like that. Now, if you cannot do those things, um, it doesn't mean that you can't start, you know, being active. Like uh, that's something that I've, you know, told uh, many people in the past where it's like, hey, let's see if we can do a fitness assessment and figure out like what's going on here. And they're like, you know what, I'm, I don't really have time. Like, you know, I, I can't really hire a trainer. And so like, it's like, okay, well, you know, try this, just get out and walk 15, 20 minutes a day, you know, um, get up a half hour earlier, get out the door and do a lap around your block. That's a great way to start, you know? Um, and then apply a little bit of flexibility and mobility stuff to that as well, you know? Uh, and then just a few very simple stretches lead to like overall healthy muscles. Eventually, that might pivot into taking up like jogging or walking. This is one of the reasons why in our sales class, you guys might remember me mentioning, writing a program for someone that's very simple and easy to follow, even if they're like, you know what, I'm, I, I don't think I can afford this training right now. You give them something easy to follow, that gives them a little bit of momentum. A lot of times people, or, you know, we as people, we're really good at projecting forward, like, you know, one of the things that makes human beings unique is that we have the ability to have like a forward thinking mentality. Uh, we're able to plan for our future and that is great, but it also works against us sometimes. Uh, like for instance, like when I have like a large list of chores, my brain will picture all of the hard parts of those chores and it's like, oh man, and I'll procrastinate and put it off till later, right? I'm sure somebody watching this video right now is like, ooh. <laughs> that's me you know <laughs> I think that's just a very human thing that we do um, and so like if you can just break it down and be like start with something simple like walking start with a little bit of jogging start with a little bit of stretching you know that can get somebody active and they can start getting some of these physiologic benefits um, now when it comes to being more specific about your exercise prescription we can consider our fit principles, right? So again, we're gonna come back to these really quick. Um, so this is gonna be, this is interesting, but this is where the fit principles actually come from. So you're gonna see these go in the wrong order and they don't use the, they aren't gonna use the fit, um, the fit acronym here. So uh, when it comes to exercise prescription, you wanna consider the type. Uh, exercise prescription, we'll say considerations. Uh, you're gonna consider the type. So that is going to be the type of exercise is irrelevant when the objective is to increase health and well-being. So this is where, uh, this is kind of a fun uh, topic here actually, because it's like, well, what's the best? You know, I think we, I think there's another thing that's true about like the world we live in today. Um, we want the best version of everything you know um it's like well i heard that you know walking is best or i heard that swimming is best or i heard that cycling is best um doesn't matter i don't care just go get active <laughs> you know i like running the most um personally but you're gonna hear somebody say that it's high impact uh I don't know what that inflection was. Uh, some people like spin biking, right? And they'll say, well, it's hard on your knees. Uh, some people like swimming and it's like, wow, what about the chlorine? You know, like there's a million like negatives and a million positives to everything. All I care about is you getting active, right? So just get your butt out there and start working, right? So type is irrelevant when it comes down to it. The, the overall objective is just to get active, you know? People you know, dislike CrossFit, that's fine if you, if it is actually bad for you, as long as you are replacing it with something else. Some people love CrossFit and CrossFit is fantastic for getting people active. It has done a lot of good in this world, you know, and it deserves credit where, it, where it is. There are so many silly, uh, exercise things out there. If you guys, if you've ever seen, uh, like the surfing, I can't remember what they're called, but there's like a surfing company that has these like surfboards and they're on BOSU balls. And then like you walk into the studio and there's literally sand and it's supposed to simulate like surfing for fitness. I think that is gimmicky and silly, but if it gets people active, I love it. You know? Um, so the type of exercise is going to be dependent on like whatever it is you're doing. Right. Um, so Really, we just want to put more emphasis on building like your endurance and building your capacity. Um, so I like the type. Uh, however, that being said, uh, when it comes to our jobs, we do want to be as specific as possible, right? Like if they have come to you to actually get hired, um, type is going to be important. So, uh, you know, considerations 
will be made based on the individual. Um, so now, thanks to the fact that like we have extended knowledge about all this stuff, like if somebody came to me and they just wanted advice, I'd say get active and I'd stop talking. Um, but if somebody came to me and like they're like, I'm gonna hire you to be my trainer, and then I found that they have osteoporosis, I'm gonna be like, well, you know what? We're gonna focus more on weight-bearing exercises rather than non-weight-bearing exercise because we're gonna to try to improve your bone density. So type is something to consider, but I love the fact that they have this in here. I think this is like a real renegade sentence in the training world. Um, it's irrelevant as long as you're just trying to improve overall well-being. Um, it becomes specific when you are being hired as, a, as an expert. Um, now, intensity is another one, right? Right. So intensity uh, is going to be an, have an inverse relationship with frequency. So intensity will uh, be determined by the frequency. Right? And that means that like if the intensity is low, then exercise frequency should be five to seven days per week. But if the intensity is higher, the uh, frequency can be lower at three to five days per week. So, uh, there is an inverse relationship here. It's very similar to sets and repetitions, right? Um, so, uh, we love frequency. The, uh, the, the, um, the recommended, uh, frequency and duration of exercise according to the U S is 150 minutes, uh, per week of moderate intensity exercise or uh, actually sorry that's low intensity exercise or 75 minutes uh, per week of moderate um, intensity exercise so you can get it done in half the time right um, 150 minutes per week is really all you necessarily need uh, to get the minimum amount of activity required to stem the effects of most of these diseases, right? Um, so on average, if you're just working 150 minutes, that's what, uh, that's, uh, let's see, two and a half hours per week, right? That's 30 minutes a day, five days a week. Um, not really all that hard, 15 minutes a day, five days a week, if you're working really intensely. Um, so that's the intensity that we typically recommend, according to the USDA. Uh, then we're also going to see exercise duration is going to be a big one, um, right? Remember, duration and intensity are going to be have that backwards relationship, but duration is the function of uh, an individual's <clears throat> ability to endure a uh, endure aerobic exercise. And not everybody's going to have it, right? Like some people are going to have more endurance than others. Um, so generally what we want to see, uh, the amount, like the duration that tends to work the best is somewhere between 45 to 60 minute sessions. So typically 45 to 60 minute sessions are all that is necessary to keep individuals in an aerobic state long enough to build endurance. If you've ever wondered why training sessions pretty much are always, um, you know, 60 minutes, uh, it's the amount of time that typically it takes to like keep somebody healthy. Could it be longer? Totally. Could it be shorter? Yeah, as long as the intensity is higher, you know. Um, if you are making up for that shorter duration with more intensity, great, go for it, you know. Um, so, uh, going back down to intensity. So, um, actually really quickly before we move forward, I do want to just translate these into, um, I want to translate all of these main pieces of information here into our fit principles. So, um, I'm going to put like an asterisk here. If I can find the key. Uh, when considering these 
variables. And ASM is going to break this information down into the fit principles, right? And so again, uh, if we break this information down a little bit further, you know, that's going to be frequency, uh, the uh, number of sessions in a given time period, uh, intensity, the level of demand of the activity, um, time, the length of time spent performing the activity, uh, type, the mode of the activity, and enjoyment, the level of pleasure derived from the activity. Right? So uh, those are our fit principles, F-I-T-T-E, right? Uh, and the E is a very nasty thing. But you will see these fit principles show up a lot. Um, so they are just going to inform you on like how to prescribe this exercise in general using these main physiologic principles that we understand. Now, when it comes to prescribing intensity as personal trainers, we've got a lot of different methods at our disposal. Um, so prescribing exercise intensity. Right. We're always going to be working at like a percentage of someone's maximum effort. Right. That's how we break things down. Um, it's just like if you're setting up like a spending budget at home, you know, it's like I make this much money per month and I want to, you know, allocate 10 percent of it to, you know, having fun every month or whatever you want to allocate. Right. Um, so your exercise intensity is a percentage of maximum effort. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at how we do this. There's the target heart rate using the heart rate reserve. This is probably, guys, going to be your most common version. That's why this one's up top. Um, and so really quickly, uh, let's talk about like what the heart rate reserve is, right? Or Carvonen method, right? Uh, the heart rate reserve is going to be a formula uh, using, um, taking into account an individual's resting heart rate. So there's the original like version of just like prescribing, um, exercise intensity, which is just using someone's like maximum heart rate and working at a percentage of that. Right. Like if my Mac, if I'm 20 years old, uh, my max heart rate, and we always use this formula is 220 minus my age. Right. So then my max heart rate would be 200. So if I wanted to work at 65% of 200, I would just take 200, multiply it by 0.65, and that would give me a target heart rate of 130. That's not bad, you know? It's actually not a terrible formula. Um, but it's not that accurate because like maybe I'm 20 years old and I've never exercised a day in my life, or maybe I'm 20 years old and I'm an Olympic level athlete, you know? Um, so my resting heart rate, the efficiency of my heart's going to be a little bit different in person A than it is going to be in person B. And that's where we have the heart rate reserve method or the carbonate formula. And so what that's going to do is that's going to take into account someone's uh, maximum, uh, I'm sorry, resting heart rate. So that's where we get our definition here. And this is the definition you're going to want to know. Uh, but it is determined by taking a percentage of the max heart rate reserve which is the, uh, actually, that's totally not the definition I want. It's the definition I want is what's in parentheses here. So it's the difference between the heart rate max and the heart rate rest, okay? Um, so that is what the carbonate method is, the difference between your heart rate max and your heart rate rest. So uh, this is used to determine exercise intensity by considering the difference between the two numbers and working at a percentage thereof, right? So we're going to work at a percentage of those two numbers there. So the way this is going to work, when you are trying to calculate someone's heart rate max, um, I'm sorry, their heart rate reserve, what you're going to do is you're going to use that Carvin, Carvonin formula, right? And so it's going to be target heart rate is going to equal uh, 
heart rate max minus heart rate rest times intensity. And then you need to add the heart rate rest back on at the end. So we need kind of different brackets here. Um, so uh, target heart rate, like whatever it is you're trying to achieve, right? Let's say it's 65% is heart rate max minus heart rate rest. Then you're going to multiply that by the intensity, which in this case, like I said, is 65%. Uh, and then you're going to add that heart rate rest back on at, at the end. So, for example, let's say you have got uh, a 30-year-old uh, a client, right? Um, client age is going to be 30 years old. Uh, heart rate rest is going to be uh, 75 beats per minute. Okay, so this is a pretty average person. This is... They're in the average in two categories, right? Um, so uh, target heart rate equals, uh, that would be 220 minus 30. So that would be 190, right? So 220 minus 30 equals 190, right? So that's their target heart rate. Uh, I'll put that in italics. Um, and then their heart rate, uh, not target heart rate, I'm sorry. That's their heart rate max, right? Max heart rate is going to be 220 minus 30 because they are 30 years old. Um, so heart rate reserve is going to equal, so we're going to grab a calculator here. So that is heart rate max minus heart rate rest. So we would take that 190 minus 75 because that's their heart rate rest, right? That gives us 115. Then we are going to, uh, and I'm going to put desired intensity here below this. We'll use zone one, right? So that's going to be um, all over the place here. Hold on one second. Uh, their desired intensity is going to be 65 percent to 75 percent, right? So the heart rate reserve is going to be 115 times 0.65, right? Uh, what are they? Uh, right? Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to add their resting heart rate back on at the end. So his resting heart rate was 75. So that's going to be 150 and then we need to do 75%. So we're going to do the whole formula again. Uh, 190 minus their heart rate rest, which is 75 times, and this time we'll do 0.75 plus, and we got to add that 75 back on at the end, 161. Okay, so that's their heart rate reserve. So we'll, we'll put these formulas down here, right? So that's going to be... Uh, 90 minus 75 times uh, 0.65 plus 75 equals one, what was it, 149 point, uh, nah, let me just do it again. 149.75. Okay, and then we'll do the same exact formula. <laughs> but I'm going to cheat so that I don't have to type the whole thing again. Uh, <laughs> we'll change that to a 7 because uh, that's 75%, and that'll give us um, 61.25. So there we go, right? So there's our, our numbers there. Um, that's how we, that's sort of how we came up with these numbers here. That's a really great way to take into account. So now my client knows exactly what I, you know, their desired intensity is. I'm gonna be like, hey, grab your heart rate monitor, get out the door. If your heart rate drops below 150, you're not working hard enough. But if your heart rate goes above 161, you're working too hard. I want you to be somewhere between those two numbers for 30 minutes. Go. 
you know? <laughs> uh, and that is, that is that heart rate reserve method. Now, there's also the classic version, which is just the straight percentage formula. Um, and so there's the target heart rate uh, using a straight percentage formula or percent heart rate max, right? Uh, and that is going to be uh, determined by multiplying a percentage of heart rate max, right? And it's not a bad formula, right? Not a bad formula, but does not take into account individual differences, right? It doesn't take into account your client's resting heart rate. So if they're in really good shape, you're not going to know about it, right? And so again, your max heart rate is going to be, um, the formula for this is going to be uh, heart, heart rate max times intensity equals target, uh, I should put this backwards. <laughs> target heart rate equals heart rate max times intensity. Right, um, so pretty simple, pretty simple formula there, right? Um, for example, let's take our client from before, right? Our client age is 30 years old, right? So their heart rate max is going to be 190. You know, that's not gonna change, right? Uh, 220 minus 30 equals 190. Uh, so then, Desired intensity is the same. Uh, it's going to be 65% to 75%, right? Uh, so that means that their uh, target heart rate is going to be, I need my calculator again, 190, ugh, 190 times 0 0.65, 124. To 190 times 0.75, 142.5, 143. Okay, so that is going to be 90 times 0.65 is 123.5, 190 times 0.75 equals 142.5. So Definitely a different range here, right? 124 to 143, that's a huge range compared to earlier where we got 150 to 161, right? Um, like that is a difference of, what is that? Uh, um, brain doing internal math without calculator. Uh, <laughs> 124, 18, that's a difference of 18. That's a pretty big range for our client. And we noticed that like 142.5, that's not, that's still below like our other intensity here, right? That's not even hard enough to experience change for this person here, right? Um, so this person might not be getting a very intense workout. Uh, whereas the difference between these two numbers, uh, which is 150 minus 161, that's a difference of 11, right? Um, so that's a very, there's a, there's a big difference here, right? Between these two formulas. Uh, and this is why we prefer to use the carbon in formula. I know it's a little bit more math, which is kind of annoying, but it's definitely the most accurate way we can do this. Now, the really most accurate way that is excellent, but requires constant VO2 monitoring uh, is gonna be target workload using VO, uh, using a percentage of V O2 max, right? Um, so this is going to allow for the development of exercise prescription as a percentage of VO2 max. Um, well, VO2, yeah. So that's definitely a much harder version. Um, I mean, it's incredibly accurate, but uh, requires constant monitoring of VO2 max um, and oxygen consumption. So if you're attached to a machine and it's telling you like, hey, you're consuming too much oxygen, we can slow down, you know, and that's great, but not always the most
practical formula to use in an actual gym setting. So again, we're going back to our best formula, which is here. We like this formula because it's so specific to our client, right? This formula is even more specific to our client, but it's such a pain in the butt to actually measure. We don't typically get to use it very often. Uh, and now another method is your RPE method. So the next one we've got is the ratings of perceived exertion or the RPE scale, okay? Uh, and so this uh, involves rating a specific exercise based on the perception of uh, exertion. So you're basically uh, asking the client how difficult the exercise is, right? So this is a really great scale actually, right? Um, the RPE method is a really, really, really great way uh, to measure client intensity. So if we look at the RPE scale, right? Um, no, that's the modified one. Uh, by the way, this is also sometimes referred to as the Borg scale. I should put that up here, actually. Um, often referred to as the Borg scale, right? Uh, so you're literally going to ask your client, hey, I want you to rate this exercise on how hard you feel this activity is on a scale of six to 20, with six being rest and 20 being, I'm about to puke because I'm working so hard, right? Um, this is maximal intensity. Like I literally don't have anything left in me. Um, so we're seeing like a scale here. Exercise begins around a 12, okay? Um, so uh, it is a scale of six to 20 to measure intensity based on the perception of effort, okay? Um, so six is complete rest, 20 is maximal effort. Exercise typically begins around a 12. And so low intensity is about a 12 on that RPE scale, right? Um, or I guess maybe an 11, you could say, like that's fair, like, like that'd be like walking, right? Um, yeah, I probably shouldn't put that actually. Uh, <laughs> that's like my perception of exercise, at least start, at least in the green zone. Um, now there is a modified Borg scale as well. You could use like zero to 10. Uh, generally people think that's a little bit easier. Um, that's the one I like to use. And so I want my clients to be somewhere between like a four and a nine uh, on that scale in general. Now, another method that works really well in conjunction with this is also going to be what's called your talk test, um, right? And this is uh, measures exercise intensity uh, by taking into account how easy or difficult it is for a client to speak during activity, right? Um, so uh, low intensity, a client should be able to hold a conversation comfortably. Uh, medium intensity, the client should be partially out of breath, but still able to speak in full but broken sentences, right? Uh, and then high intensity, speaking should be very difficult, okay? Um, so there is definitely like a difference. Talk test is pretty good, by the way. I like the talk test. Uh, and lastly, we've got METs. Um, and so target activities using METs. These are also pretty difficult to measure, but we actually have charts that kind of have all this done. Um, so target activities using METs or uh, metabolic equivalents. Okay, um, so what a MET is, uh, is a MET is a 
measurement of the energy expenditure of a specific activity in relation to resting energy consumption. Okay, so when you think about like what a met is, uh, one met equals uh, 3.5 milliliters of oxygen consumed uh, per one, every one kilogram of body weight per minute, okay? Um, so what a met is, is it's you, every person, you, me, everybody, we all consume 3.5 milliliters of oxygen. So like however much, you know, like however many milliliters are in this bottle here, um, I would consume 3.5 milliliters of that oxygen for every kilogram of my body weight every single minute. So if I'm consuming seven milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute, I am burning two mets worth of energy, AKA I'm burning twice as much energy as I would have if I were completely at rest. So this is where you see charts uh, like this, like uh, energy expenditure of different activities. So if you guys have ever seen like those charts on Instagram and uh, things like that, uh, where it's like, you know, you need to go do this many minutes of activity in order to be able to like burn off uh, a Snickers bar or whatever. They're kind of actually using METs to determine that. And so like your energy expenditure, right? Um, this is how many calories you burn per minute per like, and they've converted it to pounds here. Um, but like basketball burns 0 0.06 calories per minute. Uh, whereas like football burns 0 0.7 calories per minute. I find that surprising. Uh, gymnastics only burns 0.3 calories per minute, which is not surprising considering gymnastics are really intense and then there's lots of resting. Uh, running at seven mi minute mile is about 10 uh, or 0.1 calories per minute. Eight minutes mile, this is so interesting. It goes down a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, but then like at eight minutes to nine minutes, it stays the same, right? So like seven minute mile, 0.1, eight minute mile, 0 0.09, nine minute mile, also 0 0.09. <laughs> um, and so there's not a huge difference there, which actually probably makes sense considering that's more of like, you know, uh, the very low part of aerobic and there's a little plateau that happens there. Strength training, you know, so you can see like all these things, there's different levels of METs, you know? Um, so when you see charts like that, uh, it shows you like, uh, let's see here, how many minutes of exercise to burn off um, McDonald's hamburger. <laughs> you, I'm sure we've seen a million of these charts here. Yeah, if you were to go have uh, a Tesco chocolate cat, I don't know what that is. Um, it would take you 149 minutes of cardio for men or 178 minutes of cardio for women um, or 199 minutes of weightlifting for men, right? So it kind of shows you the difference here um, in terms of like how long it's going to take you to burn those things up. Kind of cool, right? Like there's a million charts out there like this. They are using METs as a science to break that down um, because like we know how much oxygen consumption it takes for specific activities. Um, I like it. It's not perfect. And I like accuracy. So I'm always, always, always going to recommend doing your carbonate method. I think the best way to measure intensity um, is to, uh, to use a percentage of max heart rate. Um, but I will say one cool thing about METs, uh, and it says it right here, they're often easier to understand because the energy expenditure is measured by like the amount of times per MET. So it's like, hey, you're burning four METs per hour you know, you're burning four times as many calories right now than if you were sitting at home on the couch resting. That's kind of cool. I think that's a fun motivating factor. All right, so we got, you can see we've got quite a few slides left here, um, but we've gotten through like a lot of notes already. The rest of these are all very disease specific. So I'm gonna move through these pretty quickly and stop whenever one of them is like specific to this course. But most of, things, the, most of these things are much better explained in our special populations class and in our senior class actually. Um, but basically what we're gonna see is like, hey, if you're inactive, you can get, and then a whole big list of diseases. So first one we're gonna talk about is atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is an inflammatory disease where the walls of your blood vessels get plaque on them. 
that often leads to hypertension uh, and uh, you know can cause like damage in the heart. So uh, that is definitely highly associated. That is one of the examples of coronary heart disease. If that atherosclerosis affects particularly the blood vessels of your heart, you are gonna be suffering from coronary heart disease, right? So obviously there are genetic factors here. Um, here's what's kind of a bummer. One of the reasons, and you guys have probably noticed this when you go to the doctor, they ask you if your family has a history of heart disease. They're not just doing that because it's like, hey, does your family have bad habits? They're also asking because like, there are certain genetic factors at play. Some people are more prone to developing plaque on their blood vessels. Um, we just think that there's different genetic markers that do that more commonly in some populations than others. Uh, like diabetes does not run in my family at all, so it's not something that I'm particularly worried about. Um, but it did manifest itself in like one of my many, many cousins. Uh, she has like type one diabetes. So like she has a bum pancreas basically. Uh, so it's not really a factor for like that I am super concerned about, but it is something her kids should be concerned about because clearly a gene that resulted in a bum pancreas expressed itself in her and she's gonna pass those genes on to her kids, right? Um, so the same thing is true of coronary heart disease. There are certain genetic factors at play there. Um, so uh, heart disease, reducing your risk through exercise. Obviously, we know that coronary heart disease can be reduced if you have a stronger heart and you can develop a stronger heart by losing a little bit of weight. Um, you know, that is going to cause your body to tap into your fat cells for energy. It's nothing special about the actual weight. The weight is not what is, is what is important. That's why like liposuction does not make your heart healthier. Um, you have removed fat cells and that's fine, but you didn't burn those fat cells metabolically. And so like burning them metabolically is where you get the benefit of reducing your weight through exercise. Um, so, uh, that can build aerobic endurance. It can strengthen your heart. And then obviously it metabolizes all of that fat. Um, it can reduce your risk of a myocardial infarction, which is a big fancy way of saying heart attack. If you've ever seen the term myocardial, they use it in TV shows and movies all the time. Like, he's got a myocardial infarction. It's like, just say heart attack. We know what you mean. Uh, <laughs> but basically, like, that's actually where the heart is, like, having trouble um, ejecting blood from itself. And so it has stopped pumping blood. Um, that can be from things like fibrillation, for instance. Uh, we also see like muscular fitness changes here as well. Um, we are going to see like skeletal muscle fibers like sarcopenia that can happen from decreased activity. So you can see like a reduction in muscular strength. Remember, strength is the maximal amount of force that your muscles can generate. Um, resistance training has been shown to like improve that. And what's nice about having more muscle is muscle is a metabolically inefficient type of tissue. It burns a lot of energy. And so if you are burning that energy, uh, you know, with your metabolism, that's going to assist in like burning up those fat cells passively, right? The more muscle you have, the more calories you burn, the more calories you burn, the less likely your body is to store those calories as fat cells. Um, so it improves your strength, it improves your endurance, and it improves your metabolism. Um, it's not actually speeding up how fast your metabolism is, it just means there's more stuff burning. Um, gender, age, whatever muscle fiber types you are building are going to affect that. Um, generally, when it comes to heart health, uh, endurance type uh, muscle fibers, type 1 fibers have been shown to be a little more uh, effective at increasing, um, uh, I'm sorry, reducing heart, uh, heart disease. But type 2 fibers are really great as well because they convert all that cholesterol to, you know, hormones. And so having a combination of type 1 and type 2 training, aka do your strength training and do your cardio uh, has been shown to be the most effective. Um, endurance is going to be huge, right? Developing for endurance, like sustained uh, strength over long periods of time. Uh, number one, that means that you're burning calories for an extended period. Uh, and then number two, you are also developing the ability to like keep your body upright. Um, Right now, we're very much talking about like the health benefits related to the cardiovascular disease. But what about your skeletal system? You know, um, having the endurance to like sit upright with good posture for extended periods of time is a very important part of like being living a healthy lifestyle. Uh, and then muscular power, right? Your anaerobic short bursty metabolism. Um, we don't think of that when we think of like, you know, health all the time. But remember, those type two muscle fibers, they are 
going to burn a lot of energy passively. Your type one fibers burn more calories than your type two fibers do. So by uh, developing that short, you know, non-endurance system, like I said a minute ago, um, you are going to be increasing your metabolism. Um, type one, very good for aerobic. Uh, type two, very good for strength. So both of them having a combination is kind of key. Um, so when it comes to prescribing uh, resistance training, this is all the stuff we've been talking about literally for the rest of this course. You can think of this as a summary for everything we've talked about over the last 10 days. Uh, but prescriptive, uh, prescription for resistance training in clients who have uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, for the most part, don't repeat it any more than like 10 times. 10 If your client has like really bad cardiovascular disease, 10 repetitions is probably about as high as you want to go just because of the time under tension. Um, now, once you have like worked up the, like some endurance, then we can start raising those repetitions and start training uh, more aerobically versus anaerobically. Um, but what's nice is you're going to see a lot of like strength adaptations very early on, uh, which are coming from neuro muscular adaptation. The nervous system is literally going to get better at controlling those muscles. So we will see aerobic or anaerobic training that will result in strength, power, and athleticism. And that's awesome. Um, so regular exercise has been shown to be beneficial for preventing those diseases. Uh, other ones that we've got, see, this is like where this PowerPoint is very disjointed. Uh, we've got arthritis, right? That's a joint disease, right? So through arthritis, your um, joints may have like degenerated, uh, you know, just through impact of like everyday life over several years. Um, aquatic exercise has been shown to be very good at, you know, fighting that. And so like uh, taking the weight off somebody's joints and allowing them to exercise aerobically or anaerobically has been shown to be very effective for that. Um, cycling is really good for that because it's less impact. Uh, there's a lot of things there. Um, now somebody could have, whoops, um, degenerative joint disease or maybe they have rheumatism, uh, like rheumatoid arthritis, but in either version, uh, basically inflammation is the big enemy here. So uh, in particular, um, putting somebody in the water and taking that, that gravity away can be really effective. Uh, asthma, obviously training for endurance, like cardiovascularly will, uh, help your clients like learn how to inhale more easily and use their diaphragm more effectively. And so generally you want to focus on duration here and low intensity. Um, so low intensity, uh, over a much extended duration is going to be one of the best ways to work on asthma. So rather than making your clients do sprints, one of the best ways is just to make them do like steady state cardio for extended periods of time. Um, cancer has been shown, uh, obviously like, uh, cancer treatment causes like the degeneration of muscles, which can reduce their flexibility and their strength. So strength training and flexibility training have been shown to have very positive effects on cancer patients, not to mention being more active has been shown to be, have very positive effects on their mood, uh, and can actually minimize the discomfort associated with all the treatments that go into like cancer. Uh, COPD, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, right? If there is stuff in the lungs, either through smoking or maybe just like a job that worked with chemicals or other materials, um, that can cause like obstruction or blockages in those uh, bronchial tubes that are traveling throughout your lungs. So again, this is very similar. Uh, this is very similar to asthma, but the duration thing uh, actually becomes much more difficult. So instead of focusing on long duration, generally we're going to focus on multiple, maybe 30 minute sessions per week instead. Uh, coronary heart disease, dyslipidemia and hypertension, we already talked about, right? Strengthening the heart through like cardio and strength training. Um, diabetes, this is going to be something that's definitely improved by exercise, right? Um, Exercise has been shown to improve both type one and type two, particularly uh, we're looking at brisk walking or cycling. 30 to 60 minutes, low to moderate intensity. Um, that's really great. I will say there's definitely a lot of research to suggest that higher intensity exercise is very good for diabetes as well. Not so high that you're using your ATP PC system, um, but high enough that you're using glycolysis because glycolysis is going to break down glucose. Glucose is going to help your body utilize uh, sugar more effectively so you're you'll become more insulin sensitive and that's definitely something we see in type 2 diabetics 
type one diabetics, we're not gonna get as many of those benefits from, but particularly in type two diabetics uh, who are not, uh, whose bodies have become resistant to insulin, you can trigger the use of that insulin um, through high intensity exercise. Uh, overweight and obese people, right? Uh, we do know that like long duration exercise has been shown to burn very many calories, which will therefore reduce that obesity and risk for those other diseases. Uh, peripheral vascular disease, which is things like varicose veins, right? Um, blood pressure changes that have caused like, uh, uh, not leakages, but like stretching of blood vessels in like the lower extremities, which can be very, 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 very painful. Um, typically we are focusing on like walking for extended periods of time. So about three to five days per week. Uh, and walking is going to be key here. Uh, because that's the type of pain they deal with. Um, so your intensity should be moderate so that you can keep the duration relatively short um, and the frequency like three to five days per week. And then after exercise, instruct your clients to like elevate their feet so that they can drain that blood uh, from their low extremities. And then finally, uh, sarcopenia and spinal cord injuries. Obviously, we know that low back pain is very common. 80% of the population deals with chronic back pain at some point. Um, so that can be affected by like core training and balance training and even reactive training. Uh, and then sarcopenia, lifting at 60 to 70% of your one rep max has been shown to like stem those effects. Um, that's not a hundred, like lifting at any, at any high intensity, 60% or higher has been shown to be effective against sarcopenia. All right, so we got the important stuff out of the way. <laughs> and then there's a whole bunch of diseases at the end. Um, we're not gonna ask you too many questions about those diseases, uh, but we might ask you a few. So I wanted to like cover them, but we didn't put them in your notes because I know you guys have got those um, in your notes from like prior classes. And we do a much better job at teaching those diseases like in those other classes. Um, do you have any questions? No, Brad, I'm okay. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, open this up here and end the recording. We'll see everybody tomorrow.